So every Halloween, I always make sure to put on a double feature of two horror movies that I love. I try to pick two that have similar themes, settings, or threats. Like all good double features, there should be something about these movies that enhances them when they're viewed together. This year, my choices are The Shining, directed by Stanley Kubrick, and The Lighthouse, directed by Robert Eggers. If you're familiar with either of these two films, the similarities will seem pretty obvious. Both take place in an isolated, unnatural location where the spooky goings-on slowly drive one or more of the main characters into a state of madness, climaxing in an outburst of extreme violence. And yes, those are completely valid comparisons to make. But if we look a little deeper, we can see that The Shining and The Lighthouse share even more than just these superficial plot elements. Their lonely settings and the horrors lurking within them reflect the mindsets and emotional journeys of their characters. And in both films, it's the male characters who end up losing their minds. I think these two films can be viewed as a commentary on how men refusing to openly process their emotions and express their masculinity leads to more and more violent outbursts that destroy their mental health and their relationships with the people around them. This is what we would call toxic masculinity. Both of them reach the same conclusion about how damaging acting in this way is, but they examine different aspects of toxic masculinity on the way there. Today, I want to compare and contrast The Shining and The Lighthouse to see how their male characters literally and figuratively isolating themselves leads to such dramatic breakdowns and what this can teach us about the complex issue of masculinity in the real world. In The Shining, Jack Torrance is a struggling writer forced to take a job looking after the deserted Overlook Hotel during the winter off-season. Owing partly to his failure to properly provide for his family, as the traditionally male head of the household is expected to, he acts closed off to both his wife and son before they even get to the Overlook. We also find out that he abused his son Danny prior to the event of the film and has problems with alcohol, which is common among men struggling to process failures like these in an open and healthy way. In every scene, we can see that Jack is, at best, mildly irritated by the presence of his family and prefers to shut himself away from them for months on end as he works on his novel. As the Overlook takes hold of him, this irritation progresses into more potent anger and then finally into a homicidal mania. But the ghosts of the Overlook, if they actually exist at all, can only be blamed so much for this downward spiral. Jack was emotionally isolated before he was physically isolated. Forcing himself to be alone in his own mind for too long has allowed his negative feelings about himself, that his job worries and financial situation make him less of a husband, a father, and a man, to fester over time and become demons that he can't escape from, just as the darkest apparitions of the Overlook only manifest when it's been cut off from the rest of civilization for months. We can contrast this with the only other prominent adult man in the film, Dick Halloran, the head chef at the Overlook. He and Danny only spend a short time together, but the difference in the way Halloran treats him compared to his father is striking. Halloran gives Danny ice cream, shares an inside joke with him, and actually speaks to him like a real person. He also goes above and beyond to try to save Wendy and Danny when he senses they're in danger, while Jack is doing the exact opposite. The main thing that links Halloran and Danny, of course, is the titular shining, the ability to telepathically communicate their thoughts with one another. They can communicate in this way, expressing their true selves between one another without even speaking, whereas Jack and Danny cannot. Any silence between them is either awkward or actively unsettling. I think this can be taken as a metaphor for both characters being in touch with their emotions. Halloran clearly makes an effort to be outwardly kind to people, and Danny is still too young to be constrained by society's expectations of what a man should be, especially in the 1980s. Jack, meanwhile, doesn't shine because he's retreated so deep inside his own head that he's become incapable of expressing his true self to anyone. If we follow this thematic line a little further, we can interpret Danny's horrific glimpses into the past as a cautionary vision for his future as well. When he sees the daughters of the previous caretaker's bloody corpses, it's a premonition of what Jack intends to do to him and Wendy, yes, but it's also what will happen to him and the people he loves if he allows himself to succumb to the darker side of masculinity like his father as he grows up. It's also worth noting here that Halloran says that he used to shine with his grandmother, implying that this ability was inherited from her. Could this be representative of another way out of the trap of toxic masculinity, appealing to your feminine side, to put it simply, or at least not actively rejecting those parts of yourself? He's happy because he's living as his true self without shame, unlike Jack, and he is visibly a brighter and more caring person. He also has a well-paying job and doesn't have to hole up in a haunted hotel for the winter, which probably helps. His death at the hands of Jack is made all the more tragic by the fact that he was simply trying to help. And if Jack had only stopped to listen, Halloran might have been able to show him a way out of the inescapable maze that Jack had built for himself. The Lighthouse also follows a small number of characters forced into an isolated setting together. But, instead of a family with an abusive patriarch, the characters here are two men with no prior relationship to each other. Or at least, they supposedly don't know each other, it's complicated, the movie's weird. Ephraim Winslow and Thomas Wake both share main character duties here, but the audience stays with Winslow through the vast majority of the runtime. Like Jack Torrance, from the moment Winslow arrives at the isolated lighthouse to begin a job that he has been forced into taking, he is repressing his true self. 
To start with, that's not even his real name. His real name is also Thomas, Thomas Howard. The real Winslow was Thomas's foreman at his old job, killed in a lumber accident which Winslow feels he could have prevented, but failed to. Again, our main character is already entering the story in the shadow of failure and attempting to get a fresh start at this new, and pretty thankless, job. Wake immediately starts working Winslow ragged, calling him lazy and forbidding him from going to the lighthouse's lantern room. Winslow resents this, as well as Wake's initial attempts to get him to open up. He wants to say closed off, get on with his work, and go home. But the worsening storm outside forces the two men to spend more time together than either one would like, and that's when their true feelings bubble to the surface. One similarity we can pick up on here in both movies are the main characters and their relation to sexuality. Not long before he begins his rampage, Jack Torrance finds an attractive naked woman in one of the hotel rooms who he immediately starts making out with because sure, why not, only to find out that she's actually a rotting corpse, another of the Overlook's twisted visions. Winslow spends a lot of the film masturbating over a carved statuette of a mermaid. This mermaid appears to him in a vision later where he was horrified to find fish-like sexual organs instead of anything close to human. Both Winslow and Jack are using surface level sexual desire, Winslow more than Jack, as a substitute for a connection that both of them are sorely lacking. And then the movies diverge in their exploration of sexuality when Wake turns into the mermaid while Winslow is strangling him. I said this was a weird film. Yes, I'm probably not the first person to tell you how extremely homoerotic The Lighthouse is. To begin with, it all takes place inside the most phallic looking object possible. Robert Patterson confirmed in an interview with the Huffington Post that the script explicitly described the lighthouse as looking like a penis. And there's also the famous scene where Winslow raves about how much he wants to have sex with a steak, leading Wake to ask him quite pathetically, You're fond of me lobster, ain't you? Lobster meaning, well, Willem Dafoe certainly thinks it means penis anyway. The scene also plays like an argument between a married couple, with Wake seeming genuinely hurt over Winslow's comments about his cooking and accusing Winslow of only saying these hurtful things because he's drunk. There's also the light itself, which Wake frequently disrobes in front of in some sort of odd and possibly sexual ritual. Winslow is forbidden from going up to the light by Wake and spends much of the second half of the film obsessively trying to get up there. Is this Wake's version of the mermaid, a quiet personal perversion that helps him suppress his true feelings for Winslow? Is Winslow's quest to get up there an odd manifestation of envy at the fact that the light gets to see Wake naked and he doesn't? Some of these might be reaches, but it's still interesting to consider. In that Washington Post interview I mentioned earlier, director Robert Eggers said, Am I saying these characters are gay? No, I'm not saying they're not either. Forget about complexities of human sexuality or their particular inclinations. I'm more about questions than answers in this movie. Okay, so let's ask another question. Does Winslow want Wake to be his father? The initial boss-employee dynamic between the two men becomes corrupted into more of a begrudging son and father relationship as their time on the island wears on. This scene, don't be spilling any beans to me. Seems more like a tender paternal moment than anything sexual, for example. While Jack and Danny want pretty much nothing to do with each other, Jack sees Danny as a nuisance, Danny sees Jack as a violent, suppressive force, Winslow and Wake seem to be terrified of how much they need each other. When Winslow tries to escape the island in the small boat, Wake destroys it with an axe while yelling, Don't leave me. He then claims afterwards that it was Winslow who destroyed the boat, further muddying the waters of their odd relationship. One of them is obsessed enough with the other to want them to stay here seemingly forever, but is it just one of them, or both? Taking both the paternal and homoerotic subtext together obviously leads to a pretty Freudian conclusion. Eggers did say that he hoped our friends Sigmund and Carl Jung would be eating their popcorn during the movie. Which brings us back to that mermaid scene. As Winslow attempts to strangle Wake during the film's climax, Wake starts changing into numerous different people, including the mermaid that Winslow has been lusting after. Eggers is drawing a metaphorical comparison between Wake and the mermaid, at least, and if we embrace the movie's bizarreness fully, telling us that Wake is the mermaid. He is both male and female, mother and father figure. Again, according to a Freudian interpretation, Winslow wants both to have sex with Wake and to kill him to take his place. And if we consider how sex is viewed through a toxically masculine mindset, as a violent act where to be submissive is to be pathetic, Winslow becomes less and less able throughout the film to accept that Wake holds a position of sexual dominance over him. We also can't forget that, as he masturbates to the mermaid, Winslow thinks about his old boss, the real Winslow, as well as Wake. Also consider that when he is only imagining the image of the mermaid, he finishes several times with no problem at all. But when actually confronted with the mermaid in person, he finds her sexual organs terrifying, literally sprinting away from her the first chance he gets. This is the only woman in the movie and Winslow is violently repulsed by her. The long-term denial of his sexuality is finally getting to him. So after strangling Wake for a while, Winslow overpowers him and leads him outside on a leash. I mean, come on. He then literally tries to bury his feelings along with him before being forced to violently strike them down instead. After this, he ascends to the light which Wake has been hoarding from him all this time and... something happens. 
he gazes at the unfiltered light, screams, and falls down the stairs. There are, as with the rest of the lighthouse, a lot of different interpretations for this ending. Ancient Greek mythology, Lovecraftian, existentialist. But my personal favourite has always been that there was nothing there at all. Winslow opened the light, and he saw... the light. There was no otherworldly force at work manipulating his actions, and the realisation that he only has himself and his own insecurities to blame for the incredible act of violence he has just committed, well, all he can do now is scream. This is also an interpretation I like for The Shining. The Overlook was never haunted, the people inside it were. Jack, Wendy and Danny, locked inside with one another, could no longer ignore their oppressed emotions and feelings, Jack's being the most violent. His repressed personal issues put his family in danger and eventually get him killed. I think drawing this conclusion for both movies drives home the comparisons that can be applied to men in real life who exhibit traits of toxic masculinity. A lot of the expectations ultimately come from inside their own heads. They're their own biggest critics, see judgement in other people that isn't there, and end up projecting the insecurities that come from that onto everyone around them. Both movies show how this toxic mindset can begin to take hold of men and how it manifests differently depending on who it is being performed to. And both films show how all forms of this ultimately lead to tragically violent conclusions. The most terrifying enemies are never external forces, the ghosts in the corridor or the haunting light that seems to be watching you at every moment. Whether it's because of trying and failing to live up to the impossible standards of gender expectations or another internal issue that's been left undealt with for far too long, it always ends up the same way. The loudest and most terrifying monsters, the ones that drive us over the edge, are the ones we create ourselves. <laughs> Now this is of course just one line of thought that you can employ with these movies, both are deliberately ambiguous in the presentation of their themes, which gives a number of different and worthwhile conclusions you can draw from them. If you disagree with where I've landed on these movies and want to have a debate, or if you have another thematic interpretation of these movies that you really like, please feel free to leave a comment down below. I'd also love to hear what movies you're going to be watching on Halloween. This is my very first video essay, so thank you so much for watching to the end. I will be trying to make these as regularly as possible, so hit the subscribe button if you want to stay up to date. Thank you for watching, and happy Halloween!